And a fine good day to you subscribers. It's Russ Barkley, back again with your Saturday Research Review. And able to wear tropical shirts now that it's after Memorial Day. Isn't that the rule generally? The unofficial beginning of summer here in Richmond. Okay, we're going to start with some dad jokes from Country Living. These are listed as dark dad jokes for some reason. Uh, but here you go. I was going to tell a joke about the layoffs, but sadly, none of them work. <laughs> What's the hardest T to swallow? Reality. Okay, I was raised as an only child. It drove my sister nuts. Eh, that's not too bad. And finally, here's a thinking person's one. Never date a tennis player. Love means nothing to them. Okay, my thanks to Country Living for those. Hope you found a little bit of humor in those for your day. We've got five research articles published this week to talk about, so let's get started. The first one is a review, a meta-analysis of all of the research done on dialectical behavior therapy. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy, but there's much more interaction in the therapy session that engages the patient to become more involved in the therapy rather than simply teaching them how to do things, what to think, what to say, and so on, and an effort at altering cognitions so as to alter behavior and life adjustment. In any case, this review was able to identify, let's see, I think it was eight randomized controlled trials that they were able to combine and analyze and found that DBT, as it's called, moderately reduced ADHD symptoms relative to the control treatments that were being used in these studies and also improved quality of life compared to the control conditions. So uh, some nice findings there showing a small to moderate effect of behavior therapy, in this case, dialectical behavior therapy, on ADHD symptoms in adults. We know that CBT, which is a variation of dialectic behavior therapy, is also helpful for adults with ADHD, particularly when it targets the executive functioning deficits known to exist in the disorder. There are several such programs with clinical manuals out there, such as those by Steve Safran, by Mary Salanto, by J. Russell Ramsey, and others. So if you're interested, have a look at some of those manuals for how to conduct CBT for adult ADHD. Okay, that came to us from the journal Psychiatry Research. My next article up is an interesting investigation on the link between ADHD, its impulsivity, and obesity, and looking at the degree of urbanization of the setting in which the person lived on those relationships. Now, keep in mind, we already know that there's a high risk of obesity in people with ADHD. And we know that this is mediated primarily by the impulsivity symptoms in the disorder that often lead to impulsive eating, poor selection of nutrition, and eating pathology, binge eating, for instance, and even outright bulimia. So the link here is fairly well known. What this study is doing is looking at where the individual lives and whether that had some effect on the relationship of these variables. It's a very large study. I was quite impressed with it. It involved 915 cities in the U.S., and they took the prevalence data they were able to obtain on obesity in adults, rates of ADHD, particularly in children, and the relevant urban features. And what they found is that, again, it was impulsivity that was linked to obesity in ADHD. And they also found that living in urban settings moderated the relationship, I should say, modulate it in the sense that it reduced it. The greater the urbanization of the setting in which the person lived, the less likely were they to see this relationship. That is, the less obesity occurred 
in those who were impulsive and those with ADHD. So uh, that's an interesting finding. And they argue that this is likely to be the case because in urbanized settings, there's a greater opportunity for exercise, and you usually have to walk more in those settings. There's also greater opportunity for better medical care, for better nutrition, uh, and access to psychiatric care and medications as well. So for all of these reasons, it may be that urbanized settings reduce somewhat the risk of obesity in impulsive ADHD individuals. So uh, a very interesting study there. I had not seen anything like this before. So my compliments to the authors of this paper that appeared over in PLOS, Complex Systems. That was the journal. All right, our third study up this morning is on the relationship of chronotype and sleep disturbances to ADHD and to sluggish cognitive tempo, which of course you know that we now call that cognitive disengagement syndrome. It's the other attention disorder characterized primarily by staring, daydreaming, mind wandering, mind blanking, and basically an over-focusing of the individual's attention on internal or mental content compared to ADHD, which is more an over-focusing of stimuli or events within the immediate environment. Chronotype, by the way, refers to your preference for time of day. That is, when are you most active, alert, engaged, uh, and when are you least likely to be so? And so they're looking at both sleep disturbances and daytime evening preferences across three groups. That is a group of ADHD individuals, a group of SCT, now CDS individuals, and a control population. These are all children, by the way. The groups are of modest size. There are about 50 to 67 individuals in each group. What they found is that there was a shorter sleep duration in those with ADHD. Not surprising, we've seen that before. This was not found in the kids with SCT or in the healthy controls. So that's important. It looks like Disturbed sleep is linking more with ADHD. They also found that there was an evening preference or a tendency for eveningness among those with SCT, and it was more elevated in them than even in ADHD, where it's been known to be associated with ADHD as well. So this was true in comparison to both the ADHD and the control conditions. Interestingly, both daytime sleepiness, excuse me, daytime sleepiness was related both to SCT and ADHD compared to the controls. And it was somewhat higher in those with ADHD than even in the other attention disorder, SCT. So a nice paper there out of Turkey that shows that there are differences between these two attention disorders and their relationship to preferences, that is chronotype, and to sleep disturbances. So my compliments to the authors. This appeared over in the Journal of Biological and Medical Rhythm Research. All right, paper number four coming up to us from the Journal of Psychiatric Research is on the relationship of maternal perinatal depressive disorders and risk of ADHD in their offspring. If you've been watching this channel for a while, I think you know where this is going and the major mistake made in this paper. But first, let's look at its results. This is a study that used a large sample, over 223,000 individuals in New South Wales, Australia. These were mother-child pairs, and they used national health records to derive their measures of depression, as well as ADHD diagnoses in offspring. And here's what they found. After adjusting for various confounding factors, but by the way, not genetics, offspring of mothers with antenatal, postnatal, and perinatal depressive disorders had twice the likelihood of having ADHD in their children. So twice the risk. They found that preterm birth did mediate the relationship slightly, 
By the way, preterm birth has been found to be linked to risk for ADHD independent of the mother's history of ADHD. Uh, so this, by the way, it also did not find a link with low birth weight or low APGAR scores. But I think you can see the problem with this study. It's a major confounding factor that I've talked about before that is not measured here. And that is the rate of ADHD in the mothers who experience depression. We know that women with ADHD are much more prone to depression than the general population. So it could be here that maternal depression is just a marker for the mother's ADHD, which is creating the risk, genetically speaking, for ADHD in their offspring. So until that major confound gets controlled in such research, the results really mean nothing. Although the authors want to interpret this as a reason for implementing early intervention strategies aimed at improving the mother's mental health and her risk of depression, as if somehow that's going to change the downstream risk for ADHD in the offspring. But we don't know that, do we? Because without controlling for the presence of ADHD genetics in the mothers, we don't know if depression is simply a marker for ADHD or not. Okay, I wish these studies would be reviewed more carefully and even not accepted for publication unless they control for the biggest confounding variable of all, family genetics. My last article up for you this morning is on the relationship of ADHD to lifetime contacts with the child welfare services system. This is a study that comes to us out of Norway. Uh, Norway, as you know, has central uh, registration and databases for their health care and psychiatric care, so it's easier to go in and look at these relationships for the whole population. In this case, they're looking at more than 8,000 children and teens followed over an 18-year age trajectory uh, in the country of Norway between 2009 and 2011, and what they found is that children and adolescents with ADHD had considerably higher rates of contact with child welfare services. About 32% of them had such contacts, about one in three, compared to the general population, which was just 6%. So to put it another way, there was a six to seven times greater likelihood that individuals, children with ADHD, would eventually have contact with the child welfare system. So that's very important to understand. Now, why was this? Uh, they found that ADHD, com that is comparing ADHD individuals who had such contact with those who didn't, revealed that it was principally comorbid conduct disorder and a criminal record that were most associated with likelihood of getting contact with child welfare services. By the way, they also found that the ADHD families were, or children rather, were more likely to come from families with unmarried parents, parents of lower income, and parents with lower educational level, all of which also affected the likelihood of being referred to child welfare services. So uh, as you can imagine, these children are high risk, they're difficult to care for, their families also have some degree of psychological compromising events in the parents, not just the children, all of which could lead to eventually some of these children getting referred for child welfare services. Okay, everybody, that's your five articles for this Saturday. Hope you enjoyed them. <laughs> Sorry for the terrible dad jokes. Uh, and I wish you all a great weekend here as we start the first weekend of unofficially summertime here in Richmond, Virginia. So as always, everybody, please live well, be well, take care, and bye for now.